Welcome to Coffee with Kyle number four. I'm Kyle Ridgway. What would make you change your mind? Uh, All these explorations of disagreement and language and precision in language the past few days had me thinking about how we change our own minds, not just how we construct arguments and interface with other individuals, both clinically and within our own lives. And a principle from psychology that doesn't necessarily directly apply, but I think helps us understand how we conceptualize our behavior in stark contrast to others, I think is helpful in this regard. And it's termed the fundamental attribution error. And the fundamental attribution error claims that when it comes to the behavior of others, we overestimate or overattribute their behavior to internal consistent qualities and choices. Whereas when we assess our own behavior and why we do things and why we acted or made certain decisions, we actually overestimate external circumstances, the environment, and non-internal contributions. So generally or simply what we would say is when we see someone else do a behavior, we look at them as making that choice or having that quality. When we assess our own behavior instead, we think, oh, that was because of the circumstances, or that was because I was tired, or that was because of the uh, improper incentives that were in play. I think that's important when we're assessing changing our own minds and trying to change the minds of other people. But when we look at that question, what would make you change your mind? I think that is the foundation of most critical thinking or most critical assessment. Um, Because we all come into any thought process or any piece of information that we're interacting with with some ground level assumptions or things that we think we know and if we don't challenge those assumptions or we don't reflect critically on what would it take to change my mind then what we talked about uh, the other day as far as having a backfire effect where we'll actually we will work further and further back deeper into what our previously held belief will definitely creep up into ourselves So when we talk about changing minds, changing conclusions, changing thought processes, you know, people, you can talk about logical thinking, you can talk about critical thinking, scientific inquiry, and usually what this entails is deconstruction, right? We want to deconstruct a premise or an idea or a conclusion to try to figure out if it's valid, to try to figure out what the contributing information is and, and if that's valid. If you think about forming a conclusion, you're going to start with a premise, you may jump to another premise, and jump to another one, and come to a conclusion. Well, we want to start in the most valid realm that we can, because every time we leap to another piece of information, we may be making a logical leap. So we want to make sure we leap from a place where we know the most, because if we don't, every leap is going to increase our uncertainty, potentially orders of magnitude. Unfortunately, as we talked about the other day, just as argument or debate can appear pejorative or negative or divisive, deconstruction, I think, usually seems negative. Because what we're doing either to ourselves or to others' ideas and um, thoughts and um, uh, constructs that they're putting forward is we actually have to look at them from a lot of different angles and lenses and kind of deconstruct them down to their, their foundational bedrock. And when we do that, it it's, seems inherently negative, I think, because we're picking it apart, and, and that can seem personal. As human beings, unfortunately, um, we cannot unpair emotion and rationality. The two contribute to each other in, in subtle ways and in profound ways. So we can't, even though conceptually it makes sense to strip emotion from rationality, the two are always in interplay. You cannot take away the emotional salience of ideas, and therefore this becomes an emotional process. But I think what is helpful when we're doing this generally, as well as with other people, is we really, we want to use logic, critical thinking, and scientific thinking as best we can. But really, we want to understand potential cognitive biases that our human, that our evolved human brains are are prone to perform. Uh, As we talked about with cognitive dissonance itself, which again is, is that uncomfortable feeling that you get psychologically and emotionally when your mind is weighing two potentially separate facts, uh, it wants to resolve those issues very, very quickly. So with cognitive dissonance, the, the path of least resistance is to run full-fledged towards the previous held belief and ignore any evidence to the contrary. But there are other cognitive 
uh, biases that can affect our ability to deconstruct or assess an idea or a conclusion. And there are plenty out there. There's you know great blogs and websites that go into the depths of some of these cognitive biases. And some that I think are interesting are the anchoring bias, which is the kind of overweigh the first information that we get. Um, so information that we get first, we kind of hold on to, and it's harder to discard later in a conversation, later in a dialectic, or even later on down the line. Another great one that I like to think about is the availability bias. And that's essentially putting too much stock uh, onto information that we have or information that we can observe, right? And this is what the scientific method is trying to correct for, is that we will always overemphasize the information that we see with our own eyes or the information that we have at our fingertips. A, sci a well-designed scientific study is supposed to take away availability bias and actually measure things and compare them to come to a conclusion. Other good ones, you know, that, that tie into the concept of kind of tribalism or the fact that we will rally around certain groups or certain identities is the bandwagon effect, which is it's much easier to believe something or get on board with believing something if a lot of other people, either globally or in your local tribe or local community, whatever that may be, believe something. And the other one that is always important, this goes to, to the anchoring bias a little bit, is we will, we, will always, we will always put stock in prior information over new information. I think recognizing these biases in others is really important. Um, and I, I think it explains a little bit the, the data that everyone likes to talk about, which is if you look at clinical practice of any uh, healthcare discipline, you know, from medicine to therapy to anything else, the data suggests that it takes 10 to 17 years for, for new research to kind of permeate into clinical practice and actually become standard practice. I think it's very easy to say we have this knowledge, why isn't it coming into practice? You know, what, what's going on here? Like we have the research, we just need to put it into practice. But I think that oversimplifies this black box or this bridge between research and clinical practice. And that's, that's not just behavior change, which is, hey, we have the research, go do the right thing. It's also belief change. And because of cognitive biases, because of the, the subtleties and challenges of changing people's minds, it, to me, totally makes sense that there's a humongous lag between research and clinical practice. And I think the only way that we can attack that black box is by better understanding what contributes to that lag. And that's the backfire effect, that's anchoring bias, that's availability bias, that's cognitive dissonance. All of these concepts contribute to that. And so we're not going to take care of that knowledge gap, or that knowledge translation gap, rather, without understanding the components of behavior and belief change. Um, and that, that is not even talking about perverse incentives with payment models, uh, what patients request, all the other nuance that's there that affects clinical practice. The other interesting thing with, is, is logical fallacies, is, is fallacies that we make when we're actually trying to think logically and rationally and solve a problem. And again, there's many out there. There's uh, great websites. I'll try to put a link to a few websites in the comments after this video that lists some. But all I want to say there is that as you learn more or try to dive deeper into cognitive biases and logical fallacies, you will start to notice them in other people. And you will start to see the subtle errors in their thinking or where they veered off course in a conversation or debate. But I want to I wanna give a little warning shot, and this is a mistake that I feel like I made a lot when I first started to try to be a critical thinker, is beware of the fallacy fallacy. And what the fallacy fallacy is, is that is discredit discrediting someone's argument or conclusion purely because you see a potential logical fallacy in there. Just because a logical fallacy has been committed does not necessarily mean the conclusion is wrong. And that there's some subtlety in there that sometimes is hard to parse out. Now, I sense, and I think there's some psychological research to support this, but don't quote me on that. So if anyone knows, please correct me in the comments is the more that we have rational tools or uh, understanding of cognitive bias, logical fallacy, and try to think more rationally and critically, we will actually believe that our positions are more reasoned than other people's positions. And sometimes it may be more challenging to deconstruct our own arguments and change our own minds because we have 
now added a layer of convincing that says, well, this is a rational position. I've thought this through very well. There's two things to take in mind here. Even though you know a lot about reasoning and logical fallacy and critical thinking and scientific inquiry and the scientific method and control and multivariable analyses and differences between association and causation doesn't necessarily mean your position is actually more reasoned. So it may feel that way, but it may not actually be. But number two, even if you have a well-reasoned position, it may still be wrong. And that's the concept, I think, in philosophy where they say a valid conclusion can actually be wrong. So the conclusion is valid based on the information at hand and the logical sequence to get there, but it may actually still be wrong. And so what I think is important is that we take the critical eye of critical inquiry and critical assessment and we turn that eye inward on our own beliefs and on our own conclusions. And then that can help us understand the difficulties in, in, in changing thought processes and changing conclusions and growing our knowledge base which hopefully, as we talked about yesterday, will actually help with collaboration and what I would call uh, cordial disagreement or actually having real dialectics where we can come to understand what the facts on the ground are, agree on the problems, and actually attack them in a meaningful way, even if value-wise we have different values or different um, commitments, we can agree on some problems and actually circle around and have a productive disagreement. So that's all I've got for you today. It was good to see you and have a great day.